Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, AC Forum webinar on the topic of anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation, VTE, and PVT and cirrhosis. We appreciate you being here. We have a lot of interest in this topic, so we're excited to uh, have the panel here to discuss this topic. Next slide, please. So I'm Arthur Allen. I'll be the moderator uh, today. Um, I'm a clinical pharmacy specialist and the anticoagulation program manager at the VA hospital in Salt Lake City, Utah, and a member of the board of directors of the anticoagulation forum. My co-moderator is uh, Deb, Deb Siegel, uh, associate professor of, uh, professor of medicine at University of, of Ottawa, also a, uh, a board member of the anticoagulation forum. And today we have uh, three guests with us um, to discuss this topic. The presentation will be largely given by um, Stephanie Carlin, who's a PharmD and a thrombosis pharmacist and assistant professor at Hamilton Health Sciences. Uh, we have Adam Sucker, professor of medicine and uh, pathology and laboratory at medicine uh, um, at uh, Perelman School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania. And we have um, uh, Karina Meyer, head of uh, the division of uh, thrombosis and hemostasis, University Medical Center. Groningen, uh, Director of Groningen Hemophilia Treatment Center and the co-founder of the Transmural Thrombosis Expert Center, North Netherlands, Chair of the Dutch Association for Hematology. So we're happy to have uh, an international partner here with us. Next slide. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hand over the, the presentation to our, uh, our speaker, uh, Stephanie Carlin. Stephanie, take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Alan, and um, to the rest of the AC Forum group for the invitation to speak to you today. Um, so as mentioned, today I'm going to be discussing anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation, DVT and PE, as well as portal vein thrombosis in the context of cirrhosis. And this is meant to be an overall summary of our newly pub published um, ISTH SSC guidance document on this topic. In terms of my disclosures for today, I have received honoraria and or advisory board fees from the following companies, AstraZeneca, Fresenius Cabi, Leo Pharma, Pfizer BMS, as well as Servier. In terms of today's learning objectives, by the conclusion of this presentation, participants should be able to review the challenges of anticoagulation and cirrhosis, describe indications for anticoagulation in atrial fibrillation, um, venous uh, thromboembolism, specifically DVT and PE, as well as portal vein thrombosis in cirrhosis. Participants should also be able to discuss the evidence for DOAC use in the three conditions listed there. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to review the new SSC guidance document statements, and we're gonna apply the information above to a number of patient cases. Starting off with some background on chronic liver disease. Um, this condition is associated with significant uh, morbidity and mortality worldwide um, and is secondary to a number of different uh, common etiologies. Um, Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is the most common cause uh, with increasing incidence worldwide uh, due to increasing rates of obesity and type 2 diabetes. Another frequent cause is alcoholic liver disease um, with increasing rates of this etiology as well, um, such that it now accounts for 30 to 50% of deaths due to cirrhosis as either a primary or a contributing cause. And then viral hepatitis, uh, hepatitis B and hepatitis C, is still quite prevalent in a number of countries and accounts for a substantial burden of chronic liver disease in those areas. Severity of liver disease and risk of mortality can be estimated using two different scoring systems, the child turcot pew score as well as the model for end-stage liver disease. The first score, the child turcot pew score, categorizes patients as A, B, or C based on clinical and biochemical markers, um, which represent well-compensated disease in the case of child turcot pew A score, significant functional compromise in the case of B, and decompensated disease in the case of C, with mortality rates uh, ranging from um, very low as high as 55% uh, at one year in patients with uh, child turcot pew C. Uh, disease. The second score, the MELD score, is based on biochemical markers um, and assigns patients a score varying from 6 to 40, um, with associated mortality rates at three months varying from 2 all the way up to 
I'm now going to discuss atrial fibrillation, which is one of the most common indications for anticoagulation in general um, and as well in liver disease. We know that there is a significant burden of atrial fibrillation in patients with liver disease, and there's increasing prevalence of atrial fibrillation with increasing disease severity. So you can see on the slide here that the prevalence of atrial fibrillation is only around 4% in patients who have a score of less than 10, but goes up to as high as 20% in those with a score over 30. The increased risk of atrial fibrillation in liver disease is attributable to shared risk factors with cirrhosis, including things like hypertension and obesity, complications of cirrhosis, including cirrhotic cardiomyopathy and hepatorenal syndrome, as well as treatments for complications, including diuretic use, uh, lactulose use, as well as antibiotics, which can contribute to hypovolemia and electrolyte imbalances, and of course, the risk of atrial fibrillation. Importantly, the risk of ischemic stroke and death in patients with atrial fibrillation and cirrhosis as, is increased as compared to those uh, without the disease. So you can see the hazard ratios for ischemic stroke here, 1.1, um, and for mortality, it's 1.4. So if atrial fibrillation is associated with increased harm in patients with liver disease, can we reduce the risk of stroke and death without an important increase in bleeding in a population who may already be at increased uh, risk of bleeding? So this table summarizes the results of a meta-analysis um, followed by three more recent cohort studies, assessing the benefit and risks associated with anticoagulation as compared to no anticoagulation for the indication of stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation in patients with liver disease. So overall, you can see here that anticoagulation with warfarin or with DOAX was associated with significant reductions in the risk of stroke and mortality with no signal for an increased bleeding risk. But the data, however, is limited to observational studies that included patients primarily with lower MELD or child Turcotte Pew scores, um, with the exception of the final study that you see here, um, which is only published in abstract form, which included patients solely with child Turcotte Pew C score. Observational studies are, of course, at risk of bias, and it's likely those that um, were at higher risk of stroke and lower risk of bleeding were the patients that clinicians chose to anticoagulate. So despite the increased prevalence of atrial fibrillation and cirrhosis and the greater risk of ischemic stroke and death in this population, along with the benefit and safety of anticoagulation, we know that patients with atrial fibrillation and cirrhosis have low rates of anticoagulation. You can see here from 2019 data that 49% of patients with atrial fibrillation and cirrhosis were anticoagulated as compared to 73% in the general atrial fibrillation population. The anticoagulant used uh, was primarily a DOAC um, in these patients with cirrhosis, um, with the majority using apixaban and smaller numbers of patients using rivaroxaban or dabigatran. We also know, importantly, that when initiated on anticoagulation, patients with atrial fibrillation and cirrhosis have low persistence um, to treatment at five years. So only 31% will remain on a DOAC at five years. Um, and 9% will remain on warfarin as compared to 44% and 19% in the general atrial fibrillation population. Historically, liver disease was thought to represent an acquired bleeding disorder, but we now recognize that this patient population actually has a rebalanced hemostatic system that likely more importantly, simultaneously increases the risk of thrombosis. So although patients are at an increased risk of bleeding secondary to various mechanisms that you can see listed on this slide as far as primary hemostasis, secondary hemostasis, and fibrinolysis, um, their thrombotic risk is simultaneously increased uh, secondary to various counteracting mechanisms. So these patients often have elevated von Willebrand factor and factor eight. Um, they often have increased platelet activation and reductions in natural anticoagulant proteins, as well as increased uh, PI-1 levels. In addition to having a rebalanced hemostatic system, um, antithrombotic use in this population um, can be challenging due to altered pharmacokinetics and dynamics. So patients can have reductions in antithrombin levels, reductions in the coagulation factor levels, um, protein binding, um, and changes in metabolism and excretion. 
Um, further, the clinical data for the use of anticoagulants in patients with liver disease is limited primarily to observational studies, which unfortunately are often of lower quality. So overall, all of this results in significant uncertainty around anticoagulant strategy in this patient population as far as which patients to anticoagulate, um, what agents should be used, uh, what dose should be used, and how long they should be treated for. So next we're going to talk about the specific agents uh, that can be used for anticoagulation in the context of liver disease. Um, the efficacy and safety of different anticoagulants, as I described on the previous slide, can be altered in patients with advanced liver disease. So our three different uh, options for anticoagulation include low molecular weight heparin, vitamin K antagonist, and direct oral anticoagulants. Low molecular weight heparin is an anticoagulant often used in the treatment of DVT or PE or portal vein thrombosis and liver disease. Um, but due to reduced production of antithrombin in this patient population, there may be a, an altered anticoagulant effect. Further, volume overload and hepatorenal syndrome in more advanced disease can affect drug absorption, distribution, and clearance. As far as vitamin K antagonists, there is, of course, significant historical experience with their use in general and in patients with liver disease, but use in advanced liver disease is challenging due to reduced factor levels, plasma proteins, hepatic impairment, and patients with advanced disease can also often have a baseline elevation in their INR. Um, and so uh, drug distribution and metabolism can be altered. Um, and further, when patients do have an elevated baseline INR, the optimal INR target in these patients is unknown. As far as DOAC use, their, increase, their use is increasing in patients with liver disease, but there are a number of challenges with uh, the use of these agents as well. Um, again, reduced factor levels, plasma proteins, um, hepatic impairment and hepatorenal syndrome can affect drug distribution, metabolism, and clearance. When it comes to hepatic clearance, um, apixaban has the greatest clearance, followed by rivaroxaban, followed by adoxaban, and then dabigatran has the lowest degree of clearance. And we're going to get into um, greater detail around the specific um, medications in liver disease in a later slide. So first I'm going to talk about DOAX versus vitamin K antagonists in general for stroke prevention in liver disease. Limited data is available comparing the benefits and risks of DOAX compared to vitamin K antagonists for this indication in liver disease. The pivotal phase three stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation trials comparing DOAX with warfarin unfortunately excluded patients with active liver disease. There was, however, a post hoc analysis of Engage AF, uh, TIMI48, which was the study comparing adoxaban with warfarin um, in patients with prior liver disease or who had liver enzymes greater than two times the upper limit of normal. So generally, this would represent people with child PUA disease. And there were similar treatment effects with adoxaban versus warfarin for the prevention of ischemic stroke, um, as well as intracranial hemorrhage in patients with liver disease as compared to those without liver disease. Additional data for DOAC efficacy and safety comes from a small RCT that I will uh, review on the next slide and otherwise from observational study studies, I should say. Overall, there were few patients with advanced liver disease included, and there was frequent use of lower off-label dosing. So this is the one small RCT that's available that compared a DOAC, specifically dabigatran, with warfarin for the indication of stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation in patients with liver disease. In this trial, dabigatran at the lower dose of 110 milligrams twice daily was compared with warfarin. Uh, there were 56 patients enrolled, about half with child PUA and uh, the other half with child PUB disease. There were no thrombotic events reported in either group. Bleeding overall was lower in the dabigatran group. Um, however, this was driven by minor bleeding. There was no difference in major bleeding. Important considerations in the interpretation of this trial is that the lower dose of dabigatran was used, the baseline creatinine was higher in the patients in the warfarin group, and the time and therapeutic range of patients taking warfarin was not reported. Additional data comparing DOAX to warfarin for stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation and liver disease is derived from observational data. 
So this table summarizes the key observational studies assessing the benefits and risks of DOAPs versus vitamin K antagonists for stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation in liver disease, um, which includes four cohort studies, as well as a meta-analysis, which is the Menicelli study here. Overall, you can see that the evidence suggests that DOACs are similarly or more effective than warfarin for stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation, as well as in the prevention of death in patients with liver disease, and they're overall associated with a lower risk of major bleeding as well as intracranial hemorrhage. All of the studies except for the last one, um, which is published just in abstract form, um, which included patients with child pew C disease, um, presumably included patients with lower MELD or child pew scores, although this information wasn't specifically re import reported. Importantly, however, there was a benefit with DOAC use um, seen in the Lee et al. study um, in the subgroup of patients who were using reduced dose DOACs, um, which may be helpful information in patients who are at high risk for bleeding who otherwise wouldn't tolerate higher dose anticoagulation. Um, and also, um, despite 80% of patients using standard dosing in the Lewal et al. study, um, there was still a safety benefit for DOAC seen with respect to major bleeding. So that's uh, definitely reassuring. So now I'm going to move on to some pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic uh, data that compares the different DOACs in patients with liver disease. And then we'll move on to the clinical data comparing different agents. So the PKPD evidence supporting the use of specific DOACs in liver disease is currently limited to uh, small in vitro and in vivo studies. The results that I've highlighted in pink here indicate an increased anticoagulant effect, while the results in yellow indicate a lesser anticoagulant effect. The results that are starred are derived from in vitro rather than in vivo studies. So when we look first at dabigatran, and despite it having the lowest hepatic clearance of all the DOACs, um, the available data that we have suggests that there may be a possible excessive anticoagulant effect um, in patients taking dabigatran in the context of cirrhosis. Um, you can see that there is a progressively um, greater uh, decrease in ETP, um, as well as a greater increase in um, INR in patients who have um, taken uh, dabigatran uh, in the context of liver disease as compared to those without liver disease. Um, when we look at the studies for rivaroxaban, there's a possible altered anticoagulant effect in cirrhosis. You can see here that there is an increase in PT and INR, as well as anti-10A levels in patients with um, child Pew B disease, um, as well as an increase uh, in drug exposure. Um, however, um, contrary to that, you do see that um, patients with more advanced liver disease um, may have a lesser reduction in ETP. As far as apixaban, um, the data suggests that there's likely similar or possibly even a reduced anticoagulant effect in cirrhosis. Um, and then for adoxaban, there may be a possible altered anticoagulant effect in cirrhosis, um, although you can see that the data is somewhat mixed here. So moving on to the clinical outcome data, comparing uh, specifically rivaroxaban with apixaban in patients with atrial fibrillation and chronic uh, liver disease. You can see in this study by Lawal et al. that the authors found a trend towards the increased risk of stroke with rivaroxaban, as well as an increased risk of major bleeding uh, with rivaroxaban, as well as major GI bleeding with rivaroxaban as compared to apixaban. Similarly, in this study by Joris et al., um, when comparing apixaban with rivaroxaban, the authors found no difference in rates of ischemic stroke, um, but there was a lower risk of major bleeding with apixaban as compared to rivaroxaban. And then when the authors looked specifically at a subgroup of patients within their study with cirrhosis, um, they found similar findings of a lower risk of major bleeding uh, with apixaban versus rivaroxaban, although the result was not statistically significant, uh, likely just due to underpowering with smaller patient numbers um, with cirrhosis included in the study. So what alternatives other than anticoagulation do we have for patients with atrial fibrillation and liver disease whose bleeding risk may preclude the use of anticoagulation? 
So uh, one option to mitigate the risk of stroke would be to refer patients for a left atrial appendage occlusion. Um, there is a couple of trials that have been published in past, um, Protect, AF, and Prevail, which found that uh, Watchman device insertion was either superior or non-inferior to warfarin um, with respect to outcomes of stroke, systemic embolism, um, cardiovascular death, and unexplained death. Patients with liver disease were not explicitly excluded from these trials, but it's unclear how well they were really represented. When we look at retrospective cohort studies of cirrhosis patients undergoing this procedure, um, they were found to have higher rates of procedural complications, namely AKI, pericardiocentesis, as well as in hospital mortality and bleeding events. So what is a potential alternative to a percutaneous left atrial appendage occlusion device? Um, well, that could be to refer a patient for a minimally invasive thoroscopic uh, left atrial appendage occlusion procedure. Um, in a prospective cohort study, um, they found that there was a lower risk of stroke, systemic embolism, and death with the use of this procedure as compared to warfarin. And this could be a possible al alternative to the watchman in patients with advanced cirrhosis um, because this particular procedure does not require antithrombotic therapy after uh, it is completed because no device is left in situ, which may predispose the patient to thrombosis, like um, is the case with a... Um, Watchman device. So what do previously published guidelines recommend for stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation in liver disease? Well, the 2021 American Gastroenterology Association guideline suggests that anticoagulation for stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation in patients with compensated cirrhosis um, should be given to patients with higher chads fast scores. Um, and then patients with child QC liver disease and or lower CHADS FASC scores could reasonably choose no anticoagulation. And then two cardiology guidelines, both the European uh, guidelines published in 2021 and the American guidelines published in 2023, state that um, as far as specific uh, drugs of choice, um, all DOAX can be safely used in child QA. Um, all DOAX, with the exception of rivaroxaban, can be used in child QB, and that when it comes to child QC dis disease, all DOAX should be avoided. Um, these two guidelines don't specifically comment on indication for anticoagulation. They more specifically refer to and focus on the choice of anticoagulation. So what have we recommended in our recently published ISTH uh, SSC guidance document? Well, in accordance with recommendations from the cardiology guidelines for the general atrial fibrillation population without liver disease, we recommend that patients with child QA or B cirrhosis with atrial fibrillation and CHADS VASC scores of two or greater in males and three or greater in females be anticoagulated for stroke prevention. However, we have uh, reduced this recommendation to a suggestion um, in patients who have lower uh, CHADS VASC scores, again, in accordance with the cardiology literature. So our recommendations do not um, differ here as far as um, patients with liver disease as compared to those without. Further, we suggest that DOACs at standard doses be used in patients with atrial fibrillation and child PUA or B cirrhosis in preference to vitamin K antagonists. Uh, we state that there's inadequate clinical or pharmacokinetic evidence to recommend for or against specific DOACs uh, for stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation in the context of cirrhosis. And then finally, we suggest a case-by-case -case consideration of referral for left atrial appendage occlusion in select patients um, who are at high risk for stroke and who are not candidates or who have failed anticoagulation and who are expected to have a reasonable life expectancy uh, long enough to benefit um, from the procedure and for the procedure to outweigh any potential complications. So that brings us to our first case, um, which is our atrial fibrillation case. And this is a 74 year old male with alcoholic liver disease and child PUB cirrhosis. He's 97 kilograms. He has a past medical history of hypertension, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, alcohol use disorder. He previously drank eight beers per day for 30 years and quit in 2018. You can see his blood work here. He's a little bit anemic, um, moderately thrombocytopenic. Uh, 
Um, he has a bit of an elevation in his baseline INR and has an elevated bilirubin. Medication-wise, he's taking what one would expect for somebody with hypertension and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. He had an EGD done in 2023, um, which showed that he had mild portal hypertensive gastropathy with no evidence of varices. This gentleman presents to the emergency department with palpitations and shortness of breath and is found to be in new atrial fibrillation. He has a chads vask score of three. So the question for our panel is, would you anticoagulate this patient? And if yes, with what agent and dose? All right, thank you so much, Stephanie, for that great presentation, atrial fibrillation. Folks, we're gonna break up the topics here and we're gonna stop and discuss in between um, uh, the, to address these cases. A couple of housekeeping items, number one, um, if you have questions, please submit them in the Q&A, uh, not the chat, the Q&A uh, in, in uh, Zoom here. And number two, I just want to highlight that uh, we have a great opportunity here because all of the folks you see on your camera that have hair growing out of their head uh, were actually authors on this ISTH uh, guidance document that we're speaking about today. So, um, so we have a question posed about this particular patient about anticoagulation uh, in atrial fibrillation, a child, uh, Chad's vascular three, pretty typical patient. So um, maybe I'll start to, with my co-moderator, Deb, how would you first start assessing this case um, to determine if we can answer the question of whether or not we would uh, anticoagulate and with what? Thanks. I guess I'm wearing, you know, so I, in my Day, daily non-anticoagulation form life. Um, I work as a hematologist in thrombosis. Um, I have a, a, an interest in uh, bleeding complications, so I'm always sort of mindful of um, assessing that as part. So I think, and, and of course, this is something that we think about with all patients. Um, and uh, one of the things that I always look at here, I'm, and I'm glad to see, is that although we're assessing this person for uh, anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation, we're also mindful of the status of their liver disease, and particularly um, whether or not there's presence of varices. So, you know, these patients routinely have um, screening investigations done, um, possibly on an annual or more basis to ensure um, that if any varices are present, they would be treated. And that's obviously an important bleeding risk factor. So I, I actually was, you know, that would have been one of the things that I would have looked at even, you know, as I was assessing for, for starting anticoagulation in this patient, um, particularly because we're not in a sort of emergency situation, you know, sometimes with acute venous thromboembolism, that can be difficult because we know that um, patients will, will require treatment. But if we're thinking of something as more of a chronic condition, um, ensuring that they've had that screening done, particularly if they're at risk or have had um, high risk varices in the past, that is something that's important to, to keep in mind. I don't know if others want to weigh in on some of the thoughts around this case, maybe Adam or. Sure, thanks, Deb. Um, yeah, I agree with you. I, I think looking at this whole picture, this patient does look like a, a, a candidate for anticoagulation based on his Chad's VASC score. Um, you know, with what agent? Well, um, you know, we uh, with with child PUB, um, DOACs are a, an option and probably a good option. Um, so I would probably think about a DOAC. And there was a paper that was just published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. I think it was published, Stephanie, after you put your slides together, but it was a, a large administrative data set of patients with cirrhosis and AFib comparing rivaroxaban, apixaban, and warfarin. And it was like a propensity matched cohort. And um, what it showed is, you know, again, these are indirect comparisons, but that apixaban was as associated with lower bleeding compared with rivaroxaban and compared with warfarin, but with similar efficacy. So um, that doesn't mean I would automatically choose a pixaban. I think that you know we have to take those that evidence with a grain of salt again, just indirect comparisons. But there are a few studies in patients with cirrhosis, and certainly in patients without cirrhosis, that suggest a pixaban carries a lower bleeding risk. So that would probably be my first choice. Uh, Stephanie, maybe if I could ask you directly here, um, because it, you know, as a pharmacist, you're a pharmacist as well. We we look at the at the pharmacokinetics dynamics of the drugs, and we say, well, wait a minute, uh, a pixaban, at least from a metabolic pathway standpoint, seems to make the least sense. The bigotran seems to make the most sense. Um, but then you shared some data with us about um, you know bleeding risk and and uh, and also 
impact on the on the uh, co coagulation pathway with the individual agent. So can you tell us on this case, um, would you lean, if we were to just look at apixaban versus dabigatran based simply on its farm co kinetics, would you tell us um, um, which one you would choose and why? Yeah, thanks for the question, Arthur. So I think prior to um, doing the, the literature review and, and writing our, our guidance document, I would have been certainly hesitant around uh, the use of apixaban. But when we look at the pharmacokinetic data that's available that I presented to you, despite apixaban having the greatest um, degree of hepatic metabolism, it doesn't appear that um, the pharmacodynamic parameters that we look at um, are affected as much as what we see with some of the other medications. And then I think more importantly, when we look at the clinical um, data that I presented, which you know suggested that apixaban was um, similarly, if not trending towards um, greater efficacy as far as stroke prevention um, compared to rivaroxaban and is associated with lower risk of bleeding. Again, observational data with the, the limitations that I discussed. I think, you know, um, knowing all that, um, I, and, and again, as, as Adam said, with, you know, many other studies kind of comparing indirectly these, these drugs and, and overall finding lower risks of bleeding with apixaban as compared to rivaroxaban, I think that would be, um, my my drug of of choice as well um and then as far as the dosing i don't think in this particular patient that there's really a reason to to dose reduce him we want him to achieve the full benefit of the anticoagulant therapy as i mentioned um, in one of my uh earlier slides patients with um cirrhosis are at a higher risk of stroke and mortality um, from their atrial fibrillation as compared to the general atrial fibrillation population. So we want to make sure that these patients are, are treated, um, uh, you know, appropriately and, and receive the, the full dose when it's appropriate. And I think without him having varices, um, without um, him other having other particular risk factors for bleeding, um, reasonable platelet levels, um, I would give him the five milligrams twice daily dosing. Excellent. Thank you for that. I, we need to get jump back into into the presentation here, but I want to make make one more quick quick point on this topic because it's important. Um, for the purpose of brevity, in your slides where you showed the the recommendations, you mentioned what to do in uh, in in CHOP A A and B. But if you look at the actual guideline document, and this is important, um, there's actually a recommendation that says there is inadequate evidence with respect to the benefit and risk of anticoagulation in patients with CHOP use. See, and I bring that up because you highlighted in the prior um, GI guidance that you highlighted that there was a similar statement. The, H, the, the cardiology guidance, which most of us follow for atrial fibrillation, really talks about choice of drug. And so in my field, working especially with pharmacists, there's a lot of, well, which drug do I use? As opposed to, wait a minute, should I, an should I anticoagulate at all? And I want to highlight that in this guidance document that that question is 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 a front of mind, and we need to be thinking more like that prior to which which agent to choose. Would you agree with that, Stephanie? That's a great point. Yeah, thank you for for bringing that up. And as pharmacists, we should all know the the IESC, right? We have to think about indication first before we look at you know what drug is going to be most effective, safe, and convenient. So great point. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. We're going to jump back into the presentation, and uh, we'll go back off camera. Thank you, folks. Okay, so we're gonna um, jump back into the presentation as mentioned and move on to, to discussing DVT and PE in the context of liver disease. So similar to what I presented in the atrial fibrillation section, patients with chronic liver disease um, are at an increased risk of VTE as well as an, a 90 day mortality after VTE as compared to age and sex match controls without cirrhosis. Also similarly to what I presented in the atrial fibrillation section, patients with chronic liver disease are less likely to receive anticoagulation as compared to those without liver disease. So only 38% of patients um, in one study filled a prescription for an anticoagulant after a diagnosis of VTE um, as compared to 77% um, with those of those who didn't have liver disease who were diagnosed with VTE. There's limited data on the optimal anticoagulant in patients with uh, VTE and liver disease. The Einstein trial looking at rivaroxaban versus warfarin, and the Hokusai trial looking at adoxaban versus warfarin excluded patients with cirrhosis. Um, the Amplify trial looking at apixaban excluded patients with active and clinically significant liver disease. 
Um, however, there was no specific cirrhosis exclusion criteria. And then finally, in the RECOVER trial, looking at dabigatran, um, patients uh, with liver disease and an AST or ALT greater than two times the upper limit of normal were excluded. Um, and similarly to Amplify, there was no uh, cirrhosis um, specific exclusion criteria mentioned. So as a less prevalent condition as compared to atrial fibrillation, less data is available um, for anticoagulation and comparing DOAX versus vitamin K antagonists um, in patients with liver disease. Um, but the available observational data that we do have suggests that DOACs are at least as effective as warfarin uh, with respect to the prevention of recurrent VTE and chronic liver disease. I've listed here the largest uh, retrospective cohort study that's available um, to address this question, um, which included patients from 2011 to 2017. 29% um, of them had uh, cirrhosis. Child Pew scores were not reported. About 3,000 patients were receiving DOAX, most of whom were getting rivaroxaban just because of the timing of um, the study where rivaroxaban would have still been more common than uh, pixaban at that time. About 5,000 patients received warfarin, and this study found that DOAX reduced hospitalization for recurrent VTE or major bleeding as compared to warfarin, and this was driven by a reduction in major bleeding. Uh, the reduction in the primary outcome was also seen in a subgroup of patients with cirrhosis, as well as those with decompensated cirrhosis. So what are our ISTH SSC uh, guidance recommendations with respect to VTE in the context of cirrhosis? Well, we recommend that patients with cirrhosis and acute DVT or PE are offered anticoagulation barring any contraindications, um, specifically active bleeding, um, in keeping with current guideline recommendations for patients without cirrhosis. We suggest the use of either DOAC or a low molecular weight heparin um, bridging to warfarin for patients with child PU A or B based on patient preference. We suggest low molecular weight heparin alone or as a bridge to warfarin in patients who have a normal baseline INR um, in patients with child PU C cirrhosis. And importantly, we suggest that anticoagulation not be withheld in patients with moderate thrombocytopenia secondary to liver disease. A case-by-case -case discussion should be made when the platelet count drops below 50 and we're getting into the severe thrombocytopenia range based on the site and the extent of thrombosis, the risk of extension, patient preference, and presence of active bleeding or additional bleeding risk factors. So with that, uh, we move into our patient case on VTE. Uh, this is a 69-year-old female with hepatitis B-induced cirrhosis. She is a child PUC um, patient. She weighs 57 kilograms. Um, in terms of um, relevant past medical history, um, she does have ascites and she requires paracentesis monthly. She is anemic with a hemoglobin of 93 or 9.3 in American units. Um, she is severely thrombocytopenic with a platelet count of 46. Um, normal renal function. She has a significantly elevated INR at 2.2, a reduced albumin, and a very high bilirubin. Um, in terms of her medications, she's on furosemide and spironolactone um, as far as her ascites. Um, and then to reduce her portal pressure, she's on Natalol as well. She had an EGD done this year, and she was found to have grade 2 esophageal varices, um, which grade 2 would be defined as enlarged, tortuous uh, varices that would occupy less than one-third of the lumen, and these varices were banded. She's presenting to the emergency department with left leg pain and, and swelling, and she was found to have a common femoral vein DVT, which was unprovoked. So I'm going to hand it back to our moderators and um, panelists to discuss whether they would anticoagulate this patient, and if so, how. All right. Thanks again uh, for the presentation and for these uh, the, this this incredible guidance document that you all authored. Um, maybe I'll start with um, with Adam, and then I'd like to go to go to Karina also and get a international perspective. Um, so, so Adam, what what are the factors here that either give you comfort or discomfort um, about the scenario, um, and um, and then how would that guide into your decision to to treat? <laughs> 
Well, thanks, Arthur. Uh, I don't know. There's there's not a lot of comfort here, but I will say, I mean, this is a patient presenting with an acute proximal DVT, which is, you know, essentially, uh, you know, an unequivocal indication for anticoagulation. The patient would have to have a very strong contraindication like active bleeding for us to not want to anticoagulate her. I guess my you know, source of comfort, you know, hearkening back to the last case and Deb's comments is that um, she is up to date with her uh, EGDs and her variceal banding. Um, so that that brings me uh, at least a modicum of comfort. Um, the platelet count is low, but it's not too low, you know, and I don't think that we need to be slaves to an arbitrary threshold of 50. So I'm reasonably comfortable with a platelet count of 46. Um, and I'm thankful that at least she has normal kidney function because um, at least that gives us an opening to, I, I, my inclination would probably be low molecular weight heparin in this patient. All right, thanks for bringing that up. Karina, what are your thoughts and how would this be handled uh, in, in, in Europe? Any any difference? I don't, I don't think so. Just as Adam says, there is not not much room to not anticoagulate, and that's maybe that's the easy part of this case. I think we're going to have a more difficult situation. What happens at three months? If this is a lady with good life expectancy, if she's on a waiting list for a liver transplant, we might have difficulties in deciding for how long we anti anticoagulate. But I would have. Uh, similar to what Adam says, low molecular weight heparin, uh, follow her carefully for additional bleeding risk that can be managed, but that's for every patient. Uh, are they not hypertensive? Is not well, are they not on concomitant drugs that you wouldn't want? But yeah, yeah. that would be my excellent. Opinion. Yeah, so yeah, oh, I'm sorry, Dad, did you have a thought? Oh, I thought I heard your voice. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, so, uh, yeah, no, I, com I completely agree here. And I think, um, again, I'm always hearkening back to the anticoagulation service, maybe the farm D in, the, in that service who's receiving a consult and how we think about these. And the fact that this case is a very different case than if this were the very same patient with atrial fibrillation that we chatted about before. And the fact that we, to Adam's point, um, you know, the way the, the very simplified term that I use is when you got clot flopping in the breeze, um, that's a different story than someone who has a two to 4% annualized risk of stroke because of AFib. And so we have to make tougher decisions. We have to be willing to do that. This case did bring up that infamous 50,000 platelet, you know, 50,000 platelets, uh, cut point that gets talked a lot about, uh, a lot about, and maybe some of our hematologists on the call would like to speak to that, but I can tell you largely that number is relatively arbitrary and not terribly well um, evidence-based as far as being the, the risk-benefit cut point. And again, the risk-benefit cut point in the Chaz Vask uh, up to a fibber versus somebody with a proximal DVT, we should not treat those patients the same. And I think that's the moral of the story. Um, would anyone, uh, maybe Deb, maybe my uh, uh, co-moderator, you want to speak to that the platelet count and what we should and should not take take away, even from the guideline document that mentioned that 50,000 uh, platelet cut point. Yeah, thanks, Arthur. Um, and I'll be interested to, to hear if, if others agree or disagree. Certainly our practice in a patient like this is to, you know, identify the fact that they have a number of bleeding risk factors, which I think we were already talked about, right? But, you know, proximal um, uh, DVT requires treatment. Um, in the setting of, of thrombocytopenia, what we tend to do in our clinic, again, there's this magical cutoff of 50. Of course, there's variability around the test, and I think sometimes hematologists might be more comfortable with, you know, liberalizing that that threshold uh, to some degree. Um, in a setting, in a patient like this with a, a significant proximal deep vein thrombosis, I would be comfortable um, anticoagulating so long as we were able to monitor those platelets closely. So you really would want to get a sense of what are they doing historically over time. You know, this would maybe be a like be someone that we would admit to hospital to initiate treatment given all of these considerations and that wasn't something I don't think that was mentioned but we might consider a short stay in hospital in Canada we are often discharging patients and treating them as outpatients routinely but this person is complicated um, so we would set up a platelet count monitoring too by our nurses in our clinic and that's something you would keep an eye on um, and I think for a patient like this at least initially I would be keen to to use something like a low molecular weight heparin uh, up front um, because of the opportunity 
you know, short half-life opportunity to adjust the dose if that's required. Um, I, I, and I think we just get a bit, a bit better of a handle on that initially and make sure that there's no complications up front. And then maybe we can talk later about, you know, some other options if things are stabilized over time, or maybe once we're entering like that more chronic, chronic phase. Um, right. Usually with a platelet count less than 30, we're very, we're much more uncomfortable to continue particularly therapeutic doses of any coagulation. So that would be something that uh, would be kept in mind. And then finally, I wanted to mention that, um, you know, paracentesis, this is some, sometimes comes up routinely, paracentesis can be done um, on therapeutic anticoagulation without discontinuation. So this person wouldn't have to um, uh, interrupt that treatment. Excellent. No, all, all really, really valid points. Um, one of the things that I, just uh, as we jump back in into the to the uh, the presentation here, uh, the good seg segue that Karina mentioned is sometimes we're not always thinking about how these decisions may actually influence a, a transplant um, plan. Uh, and I think we're going to see that even more. Uh, it's a great segue. We're going to see that even more in the next topic, which is PVT. So I will kick it back over to uh, to Stephanie. Take it away. Hey, thanks, Arthur. Um... So moving on to portal vein thrombosis, um, which is another common indication for anticoagulation in liver disease. So just by way of a bit of background and introduction, um, the portal vein, as you can see here, um, it functions to drain blood from the gastrointestinal tract as well as from the spleen to the liver. And importantly, it differs from the hepatic vein, which drains blood from the liver into the IVC. When it comes to pathophysiology of portal vein thrombosis, liver fibrosis leads to portal hypertension, which results in enlargement of the portal vein and formation of portosystemic collateral vessels. The increase in portal vein diameter and the steel effect from the portal collateral circulation ultimately leads to reduction in portal blood flow and a risk of portal vein thrombosis. And then further, the risk of portal vein thrombosis can be increased secondary to endothelial dysfunction, which can result from the portal hypertension, um, as well as from bacterial translocation, which can induce um, endothelial expression of von Willebrand factor and factor eight. Um, the prevalence of portal vein thrombosis in cirrhosis is quite variable um, from about 0.6 to 25%. Um, and the risk increases with increased severity of disease. It is frequently chronic and asymptomatic and often it's identified on screening investigations, for example, for hepatocellular carcinoma um, or um, when done in patients with decompensated liver disease. In terms of the complications, portal vein thrombosis could progress, which could impede anastomosis um, and increase surgical complexity and post-transplant mortality. Um, ischemic bowel um, is rare in this particular patient population. Um, in large part because of the, um, the decompression from the portosystemic uh, collateralization that has formed in these patients. So in terms of anticoagulation for portal vein thrombosis and liver disease, a registry study of splanchnic vein thrombosis um, found, of splanchnic vein thrombosis patients found that those who were not anticoagulated were more likely to have cirrhosis. So this suggests some possible hesitancy in anticoagulating this patient population. So not surprising. Um, however, anticoagulation, particularly in chronic asymptomatic portal vein thrombosis and liver disease is associated with improved, um, but low rates of recanalization with 59% of patients recanalizing um, with anticoagulation versus 21% without. Um, a recent individual patient data meta-analysis in patients with cirrhosis and portal vein thrombosis found a survival benefit with the use of low molecular weight heparin or vitamin K antagonist, um, independent of whether their portal vein thrombosis recanalized. In this study, the hazard ratio for all-cause mortality was 0.59, um, and there was also um, uh, non-portal um, hypertension-related bleeding uh, and increase. So we saw 9.7% versus 1.7%. Um, there are a number of limitations to this in-portal study, um, and that included that the studies were quite heterogeneous regarding the portal vein severity and the type of anticoagulant that was used. Um, it was adjusted for confounders, um, but of course you can't exclude residual confounding. Further patients were quite young, um, uh, 
and many may have been transplant candidates with a clear indication for anticoagulation, which would limit the extrapolation of data to an entire population of patients with uh, cirrhosis and portal vein thrombosis. So what about the use of DOAX specifically for portal vein thrombosis and liver disease? So there is uh, quite limited evidence um, for the use of DOAX for portal vein thrombosis in general, and more specifically patients with portal vein thrombosis in the context of liver disease. There was a randomized control trial of 80 patients um, with hepatitis C um, virus cirrhosis. Um, they had lower child PUA scores and MELD scores um, who had acute portal vein thrombosis. Um, most of these patients um, were um, post splenectomy and it compared rivaroxaban 10 milligrams twice daily with vitamin K antagonist. The study reported an increased resolution of portal vein thrombosis with rivaroxaban um, as well as reduced bleeding and increased survival. However, the study was retracted by the editor due to methodological concerns. Um, and so the data otherwise is just limited to small cohort studies and meta-analyses of these small cohorts. Um, overall, they do suggest improved recanalization as compared to warfarin with no increase in bleeding. Overall, you can see listed on this slide that there is an increased number of guidelines over time um, addressing the issue of um, anticoagulation for portal vein thrombosis in the context of liver disease. So this is really reflecting an increased interest in this issue. Um, overall, you can see that there's consistent recommendations from the three most recent guidelines as far as the treatment of recent or progressing uh, portal vein thrombosis as well, they generally recommend the treatment of patients with uh, chronic portal vein thrombosis with additional risk factors or those who are potential liver transplant candidates with the goal of improving uh, transplant success and mortality. Um, as far as anticoagulation options, um, all of the guidelines recommend that low molecular weight heparin or warfarin can be used. And the two newest guidelines also suggest that uh, DOAX may be appropriate options um, for this indication. So finally, we move to what our recommendations are, were in our most recent guidance document. So we recommend that anticoagulation be administered for all patients with cirrhosis with a symptomatic portal vein thrombosis for a minimum of six months. We suggest anticoagulation for all patients with cirrhosis with asymptomatic but progressing portal vein thrombosis for a minimum of six months, unless there's clear contraindications. We recommend continuing extended anticoagulation for all patients with cirrhosis and portal vein thrombosis who are candidates for liver transplantation, again, with the goal of improving their outcomes unless they are actively bleeding. Anticoagulation could be considered in patients with cirrhosis and asymptomatic portal vein thrombosis who aren't otherwise candidates for liver transplant on a case-by-case -case basis, as anticoagulation may be associated with a survival benefit, as I showed you in the IMPORTAL study, um, but this would require regular reassessment of bleeding risk. We recommend evaluating for the presence of varices and ensuring adequate management of those prior to initiation of anticoagulant therapy um, and refer to other guidance documents for recommended strategies. We suggest that DOAX or low molecular weight heparin with a bridge to warfarin be used for patients with child PU A or B cirrhosis and suggest the use of low molecular weight heparin alone um, in child PUC cirrhosis, or as a bridge to vitamin K antagonists in patients who have a normal baseline INR. So that brings us to our last case, uh, which is a 62-year-old gentleman with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and associated child PUB cirrhosis. He has a history of hypertension and dyslipidemia, as well as obesity, certainly risk factors, which likely led to his non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, he does um, have recurrent spontaneous bacterial peritonitis as well as hypothyroidism. Um, his medications are as listed here. Um, you can see that he's on some antihypertensives um, as well as a statin um, prophylaxis for his recurrent SBP and of course levothyroxine. In terms of blood work, he's mildly anemic. Um, he's mildly thrombocytopenic, um, has a bit of an elevation in his baseline INR, um, and then a little bit of an elevation as bilirubin and ALT. This gentleman presents to the outpatient radiology department for an abdominal ultrasound screening for hepatocellular carcinoma. 
And the ultrasound reports that uh, he has nodularity of the liver in keeping with cirrhosis. No discrete liver lesions are identified. However, the right portal vein demonstrates a chronic appearing non-occlusive thrombus. So once again, I'll hand it over to our panelists um, in terms of what, whether they would anticoagulate this patient and if yes, how they would do so. Excellent, thank you again for the summary. And we're we'll start this off um, with, with uh, Karina and specifically, of course, as before, if you could review the case and let us know your thoughts on the case. But one thing I would mention is if you've been around this field long enough, uh, to remember the, uh, the the last of the anticoagulation Bibles, the supplement uh, in chess was about that thick. Um, in that last, I believe it was 2012 was the last time uh, that, that they mentioned that if you had asymptomatic um, kind of incidentally identified splenic vein thrombosis, you didn't necessarily have to treat. And I think that that probably still gets quoted quite a bit. So I'd be I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on you know, that approach back then and maybe what has changed uh, and how, how you'd approach this case. Okay, thank you, Arta. Uh, in, in my center, the first question would be, is this an OLT candidate? Because if there were a candidate for liver transplant, we would anticoagulate. We would, of course, look back whether this is new. I think so. I think this gentleman will be followed with six month intervals, but it's important to realize that some of these patients have had these clots for years and nobody starts anticoagulation for something that has been there for, that has been stable for such a period. But if this were a liver transplant candidate, we would anticoagulate. If he, if he were not, I think we would follow. We would not start anticoagulation for an asymptomatic clot, but we would follow him up for say in two, three months to see whether it's progressing. And if it's progressing, we would start anyways. And I think that's nicely in line with the guidelines as we said. I think choice of agent is a really easy one. It's a child pub, he is a candidate for DOAC. He has an INR of 1.5, so he's not a realistic candidate for warfarin. Yeah, oh, sorry to me to interrupt. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that, that that stance. And, you know, we have a group of hematologists here. And so it's easy for us to look at this and say, well, it's chronic appearing. It's probably been, you probably have to use a hammer and chisel to get it to come out of the uh, the portal vein. But very often I will find GI docs, liver docs that see something like this and say, well, we should give them a course of the anticoagulant to see if it'll dissolve it. And what I've really come across lately is really this stance of having realistic expectations of what anticoagulants do. Um, the other thing I would I would mention in this is is you'll note in the recommendations that Stephanie presented, this was the only time where there was this recommendation for variceal screening. And as Deb pointed out, really in anybody with 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 cirrhosis starting anticoagulant, like that should be something that we're thinking about is variceal screening. But it's specifically mentioned in this setting, most likely because portal vein thrombosis is a driver of uh, of varices and something that you would see. Um, so. I don't know, Stephanie, if, if you have thoughts on that, um, you know, the, the variceal screening specific to, um, uh, you know, this, this particular uh, recommendation. Yeah, so we generally, um, as you saw in, in our guidance document, we recommend that this be done prior to um, right. initiation of anticoagulation. And I think it's especially important in patients who, in whom the benefit of anticoagulation is going to be a little bit more uncertain. So especially if this patient were not a liver transplant candidate, for example, and they have a chronic um, portal vein thrombosis, I think we really want to ensure that their, their bleeding risk is, um, is acceptable before embarking on um, on an anticoagulant, which you know wouldn't be unreasonable choice in this patient, just given what I have presented um, as far as the data with the Importal study, um, but um, you know also reasonable to to choose not to anticoagulate as well. I'm gonna I'm a, I'm so sorry for those who have submitted questions. We're running low on on time. We won't have a lot of time to get to questions. I do have one more thing that I think is 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 important for both the specifically the VTE and the portal vein thrombosis is. Um, how does the patient's bleeding risk, the severity of cirrhosis and how that might drive bleeding risk impact your decisions about uh, duration? Uh, because, you know, specifically preferring to DVT-PE, the out uh, for long-term uh, therapy recommendations is high bleeding risk. And that patient that we had in the VTE case, for example, was a very high bleeding risk patient. So uh, while it might, while you might favor treating in the acute setting, do does a patient like that or like we're seeing here impact your duration uh, uh, decisions. And we can look at both VTE, uh, excuse me, DVT-PE as well as portal vein uh, 
uh, 30 second answer if you can. Uh, Adam, let's start with you. Yeah, I think it's definitely part of the equation, uh, bleeding risk against the risk of recurrent thrombosis. Of course, the big advantage you have when you're evaluating a patient after three months or six months of treatment is they've they've already had a stress test and you can see how well they've tolerated and that greatly informs you know my decision making, maybe even more so than sort of pre-existing bleeding risk factors. Right. Uh, Karina, your thoughts? Uh Exactly the same. For me, low platelet count doesn't count that much if it's hypersplenism, different from mm -hmm. the hematological diseases. And my GI colleagues always tell me, if you start bleeding from your from your very varices, it doesn't matter that much whether you have anticoagulation on board. Mm -hmm. But that might be viewed viewed differently. Right, right. Well, like like I tell patients, if uh, if you put your hand through a table saw, that's a bad day, whether without an anticoagulant. It becomes worse with an anticoagulant. So you're exactly right. So I'm so I, I do apologize, folks, that we didn't get get to more of the of the submitted questions. We had a great question. I think that we covered most of the pre-submitted things and probably some of the some the, the questions submitted here throughout the discussion. I want to thank our our panelists. Um, uh, appreciate uh, taking the time and 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 really really appreciate this document. We spoke to atrial fibrillation. Uh, well, we've had documents on VTE and portal vein thrombosis, but the fact that this incorporated atrial fibrillation in a cirrhotic population makes this pretty good uh, um, and unique um, uh, document. So thank you so much. We'll go to the next slide. Actually, we'll jump past this if we could. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, my co-moderator, uh, Deb Siegel. I want to thank... Um, our uh, our panelists as well for taking the time to do this. Um, we have a this, these are just amazing experts. Next slide. And uh, just some uh, some housekeeping. Uh, we have an upcoming uh, boot camp, a virtual boot camp coming up uh, October eighteenth and nineteenth. If you haven't attended these, these are excellent opportunities, especially. I like to really focus these in on new staff, but certainly um, those of you who've been in the field for a while can benefit from these as well. Uh, next slide. And that, by the way, incorporates up to a minimum of 14 hours of, uh, of, of CE credits. And then uh, we're coming to DC um, 2025 in spring. We're going to have the next uh, biannual um, AC Forum meeting, uh, three days, 30 plus experts in the field will be presenting 70 plus ab abstracts, lots of CE. Uh, don't miss it. It'll be a great, great time. Next slide. And then uh, just a word on Centers of Excellence. The Center of Excellence program uh, was developed in 2012 uh, and uh, really empowers healthcare professionals to deliver top tier care to patients on antithrombotic therapy. Uh, and it's it's overseen now by over 30 experts and the, and the program offers a structured approach for consistent uh, excellence in anticoagulation management and it's open to all dedicated to improving uh, patient care. Um, to become a Centers of Excellence uh, what, uh, site, you can take the assessment uh, or you can just uh, also target the resource center uh, on there as well. Next slide. And then uh, hot off the presses is this uh, new stewardship. Um, the, the first ever anticoag st stewardship took place, uh, summit, excuse me, took place on June 7th in Washington, DC, where we had over 25 stakeholders and we now have this uh, document this document available on the AC form website to check out you can download it um, to check out kind of the uh, what what happened and some of the um, uh, discussion that took place at that summit so again uh, thank you so much for your time uh, look for, look forward to seeing you at the next uh, AC form webinar and you all have an excellent day